don't let them know. I'm going to play a little trick on my old buddy, author Ted Barris. He thinks I'm interviewing him about his books, which I eventually will. But I'm going to start by interviewing him about other people's books. I'm going to start with James A. Michener's Tales of the South Pacific, which became the great Broadway play. Ted, welcome. Nice to see you, Alan. Now, I have a quote from your fellow author for you. Speaking of the people who fought in the Pacific, they, like their victories, will be remembered as long as our generation lives. After that, like the men of the Confederacy, they will become strangers. Longer and longer shadows will obscure them until their Guadalcanal sounds distant on the ear like Shiloh and Valley Forge. I'm just wondering if that happens to be where we are with Vimy. Vimy Ridge, the famous battle that you've written a book about, is it too long ago to have the kind of meaning it did for our generation? You're right, I think, to suggest that the shadows are long and the memory is fading. But in Canada, we don't have a great deal of military bravado and a lot of um, mythology to glom onto, to hang on to, to recognize, to observe, and in certain cases to celebrate. So the moments are fewer. We're a smaller population. We're a younger country. So many of the stories that have become iconic to us, yes, as you rightly point out, the shadows are quite long because it's a long, the, 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 those who, who survived the battle um, have long since gone. But in Canada, the uh, April date, April 9th through 12th every year has a fascination for new generations because we as Canadians have grabbed this moment to recognize that it has significance, not just in terms of its military success because the Canadians took the ridge in those three days, four days, um, but because it has a um, deep resonance for who we are as a people, our growth as a nation and our stature in the world. Uh, we don't have that many of those moments. And so the ones that are there, few and far between, are significant and worth holding on to and preserving the shadows. And, and that importance was recognized almost instantly at the time, wasn't it? It was. Uh, oddly, uh, when the Canadians took Vimy Ridge by the end of the fourth day, the 12th of April, 1917, the French just were absolutely overwhelmed. They called it Canada's Easter gift to the French. Um, of course, the British, who were our superiors on the battlefield, claimed that it was a British victory, <laughs> which was typical. And indeed, uh, British command did supersede Canadian command, but we'll get into some of the details of how that worked. And then, of course, the Americans, who had just days before joined the Allies to come into the war in 1918, and not until a year from uh, the Vimy uh, attack and success, they celebrated the Canadians as tremendous victors and models of military excellence. So the world recognized at the moment this incredible achievement because this was the first major victory for the Allies in the war that all of the Allies could celebrate, a significant uh, setback for the Germans and a sense that the tide was turning. Now, you would still maintain, I just want to press on you, like if you and I were still doing radio, I would challenge your assertion and I would say, well, what about the Boer War? What about the War of 1812? What about the Fenian Raids? Weren't there other events in, in Canadian military history uh, that rival this or does it rightly uh, stand front and center in those events? The really good question because those were significant moments in our history too. The Fenian Raids, how we deflected uh, the, the potential for bringing down what, what, what was a very new confederation. And of course, the, the extraordinary uh, uh, several years of the war of 1812 to 14 and the uh, the victory that we believe uh, was ours. Um, but I think part of the, the mythology of Vimy is that we've got this monument, this monument that was built between the end of the Great War, um, the designs first coming to fruition uh, in the early 20s, and then its, its ultimate uh, opening in 1936 on the eve of the Second World War. But this monument tends to be a vortex even from the moment it was opened in 1936, remember that's right in the middle of the Great Depression, Canadians left Canada by the thousands, 
and CP uh, rail and CP ship lines made it easier for the thousands who traveled from Canada to Vimy to acknowledge the memorial in that moment in July of 1936. And from that moment on, and partly because the French gave that land to Canada, you can walk on Vimy Ridge and you're back in Canada. It's sovereign Canadian territory. So partly because of the monument and, and the swirl around it of stories, of memories, of significant uh, events that occurred there in the, in the flow of the war, and because we look at it as a moment in which we, we became a nation, it has that uh, strength to maintain above head and shoulders above many of the other things, I think. Now, I'm looking at it as a historian in the 21st century, looking back a little over 100 years. Perhaps if I had been writing about the Boer War and the Fenian raids uh, around the turn of the last century, um, I might say the same thing about those other occasions and events and, and, and battles and be um, as you know, waxing eloquent as, as I am trying to about Vimy. Well, Ted, here's exhibit A, your book, Vimy Ridge, and uh, it is a tremendous book. And I've, I've got to tell you, I'm sure you knew Pierre Burton. And here's his book on Vimy Ridge. And you knew Pierre Burton in the same way I knew Pierre Burton, uh, hanging around the CBC, but you had a bigger in than I did because your father was a panelist on Front Page Challenge and wrote for Front Page Challenge. And I knew and admired Pierre Burton as I'm sure you did. But frankly, I think your book uh, goes into more detail both before and after the event, not just the tactics there. And you do a neat thing that I think uh, Conrad Black also does. And I know he's a controversial character, but his books are great. And that is, he says, this will have ramifications 30 years later. For example, Foch said the Treaty of Versailles was not a treaty, it was a 20 year armistice. And uh, Black says he was off by two years. <laughs> um, at any rate, let me play another rotten trick on you, because as I've alluded to, you're a broadcaster, journalist, taught journalism. Let's just say I uh, had been in master control at the CBC at the time, which would have been on Jarvis Street, I think, to the old uh, girls school. And you were off covering, oh, no, there was no CBC in World War I, but, that, but there, there was almost broadcasting. There was broadcasting going on in those days. XWA Montreal, the first right. regularly scheduled station. At any rate, I'm in master control on Ogilvy Avenue or wherever that was. And you are over there covering the war. You have, uh, I will count you down. I would like a minute and a half, please. A report that we can play on the significance of Vimy upon the Canadian victory. And this is, let's say, you know, an hour or two after. Ted, three, two, one, go. It's quiet in Vimy on the evening of the 12th of April this 1917 year, and a significant event has occurred on the ground where I'm standing. These heights known as Vimy Ridge have been taken by the Canadians in the four days prior to this moment. And its significance is in the sinews that connect these men who brought this victory. For the first time in the Great War, all four Canadian divisions have fought together. They have been previously sent off to serve other armies, the British, the French, the colonials, whatever. This is the first time the Canadians have fought together to successfully take this ridge. It is a ridge that has been controversial because of its significance in height and the territory that the Germans took when they won it in 1916. It's right at the edge of a place called the Douai Plain. I can see it from where I'm standing. And out across the Douai Plain, even today, there are sledge piles indicating, or slag piles indicating the value of this plain that the Germans had taken in 1916. And we are on the precipice overlooking them because they are full of the greatest deposits of coal in all of Northwestern Europe. So that is certainly significant. What makes this victory in addition to the ground that's been taken, the height that's been taken, and the importance of this date, the 12th of April, 1917, is that previous to this date, all of the armies that have preceded Canadians in attempting to take this ridge from the Germans have failed. And in the cost of that failure, 140,000 casualties. We are still counting the dead and the wounded in this battle today. There are as many as 10,000 casualties, dear, horrible casualties to Canada but they predicted as many as 80,000 
of the 100,000 men who came up this ridge. So in effect, we have stood on the ground that was previous to today, an absolutely uh, vital, strategic, important view to the rest of the Western Front by the Germans has been lost and gained by the Canadians for the first time since the war began three years ago. And that was Ted Barris for XWA Montreal 19, what was the date? April the 12th, 1917. 1917. Well, uh, there were other radio stations on at that time, very experimental, but uh, you would have been great. Not quite as stilted as most of the announcers in those days, uh, a little more conversational, but thank you. Ted, there were numerous firsts, as I recall, and I think uh, I've already compared, and you won the comparison with Pierre Burton's book, but he, I think, makes a little more out of both the creeping, well, you described the creeping barrage better, but he makes a big deal out of uh, indirect fire and uh, also acoustical techniques that helped in, in the battle. Now, this was um, almost revolutionary at the time. Can you describe the, uh, you know, the, what are, the physics, I guess, the acoustics, the science of what they were doing? In order to take the ridge, the Canadians had to prepare it, prepare the battlefield for the strategy that they would use. Um, we had learned a bloody lesson at the Somme in 1916, and the script of that battle and so many others in the Great War read like this. You had a very narrow no man's land between two armies, and one army would decide that it wanted to take the ground on which the other was standing, and so they would engage their artillery to blast the hell out of the opposition, try to flatten everything on, on the enemy trenches, all of their artillery positions, and then there would be a pause at the end of the artillery barrage. And then the armies would rise from the trenches and attempt to race across no man's land and take that ground that had been blasted by the artillery. And in so doing, the defenders simply pop up from hiding underground during the barrage, set up machine guns and mow everybody down. And that had gone on to a bloody degree at the Somme. And when Arthur Curry, who was then leading the Canadian army, he was the Colonel of the 1st Canadian Infantry Division, he was to command the Canadians. They were gonna do everything differently. They were still going to use a barrage, but in a different way. So the barrage would be used in two me methods. First of all, you mentioned the creeping barrage. Once the battle began, instead of having the barrage, pause, attack, it was the Canadians idea to do them simultaneously. In other words, if you could imagine walking forward and your friendly fire guns from behind, the British and the Canadian guns, are firing over your head and the shells are landing and retreating in front of you as you walk forward. It would mean that the Canadians would arrive at the top of the ridge, the enemy's trenches, and there was a series of trenches going up the ridge. They would arrive at the very same moment that the shells cleared that trench and then the Canadians could uh, tackle the trenches, uh, kill the, the defenders and take the line. That was the creeping barrage. It was filled in. The gaps in between the artillery shells were to be filled in with another Canadian technique, the use of machine guns arching their fire to fill in the gaps. That was the creeping barrage. Now, the other plan they had was if they could get the opportunity to knock out as many of the German guns, which were beyond Vimy Ridge on the German side in that plane I mentioned earlier, the Dewey plane. If we could get to those guns and eliminate their potential defensive fire before the battle began, so much the better. And this is where some of that science that the Canadians used came into play. They used two techniques. One of them was audio and the other one was visual. By this time, uh, Billy Bishop and members of the Royal Flying Corps have now moved into the same area and they've knocked down some of the German um, air surveillance balloons, which are giving the Germans even more view of the Allied trenches. The Air Force knocked them down and then they uh, inflated and launched air surveillance balloons on the Allied side so that we could see what the Germans were doing for the first time. And from those positions, if you can imagine that the balloons were stationed on either end of the ridge, the ridge kind of goes from southeast to northwest. If you have one large air surveillance balloon at the end of that southeast uh, end of the ridge and another one at the northwest and they're both up at the same time and they're watching flashes of German gunfire. And if you took graph paper, the same way you would triangulate 
on an object in the distance, that's exactly what they would do to figure out where the gun positions were. Now, uh, it was uh, a Colonel McNaughton who was uh, in charge of this uh, flash spotting where they would plot where the guns were. Of course, the French and the, and the British were a lot rather um, skeptical of its uh, objectives and its ability to do anything. And they couldn't figure out as the battle dates were coming closer, the Easter that was the planned date of the attack, um, why McNaughton had not started to blast the German positions. And he showed them what he was doing with the sound plotting to figure out where all the German guns were. And they thought he was nuts. They thought it was all fan doodles, what they called it, which is another way of saying BS. He said that this was gonna work. The other thing they did is they did exactly the same uh, principles in plotting visually, audially. They set up microphones. So you were right. We didn't have radio back in 1917, but we did have audio and we were able to calculate the same way we did visually where the guns were audially when they fired, which meant that on the eve of the battle, instead of throwing shells blindly at the Germans, McNaughton would pick his moments, pick the positions, and for a week and a half, two weeks, he would knock out those German battery positions long before the battle began. And so that week of suffering that the Germans talk about, which was the barrage that began in late March and went right up to the very moment on April the 9th that the battle began, wiped out between 70 and 80% of the German guns on the other side of the ridge. Is that well, clear? You, you tell a brilliant story, both uh, in, in you know, audio fashion, uh, that would be great for radio or TV, but also in the book. Uh, but if I can add my two cents worth of emphasis, I gather that this walking carefully behind the creeping barrage to get up to the German emplacements was about the first time in the war that um, an army had ever captured the opposing forces artillery. It was that effective as opposed to the back and forth of the sum you described. That, have I got that right? You do, because this had to be precision at its best, at its utmost. You had to be sure that the men were not work walking too quickly, else they would walk into their own shells landing in front of them, or too slowly so that the element of surprise was lost. And so they rehearsed this. They called it going over the tapes. What they did was, and the Germans had no idea this was going on, miles and miles and miles behind the lines, they replicated the battlefield of the ridge in a sort of a rehearsal area. And they actually walked the soldiers through the creeping barrage uh, walk. They called it the Vimy Glide. And it had to be timed perfectly. And there's a wonderful moment in the book, which I found in the memoirs of a brigadier. And the brigadier um, has trained each of the 48 battalions to do this glide across the rehearsal tapes and to arrive at certain trenches at specific times so that the troops can leapfrog over those trenches and advance up the hill behind the barrage. And he he's walking on his horse. They're not firing in the rehearsal. They're just walking with watches and essentially going by time to arrive at the trenches methodically in the same synchronized fashion. And the brigadier is standing next to a corporal who's down in this trench. And the brigadier's on his, on his horse to kind of guide and instruct all this. And he turns to the corporal and he says, corporal, where are you? He says, I'm at the red line, sir, which is one of the trenches. And he said, what are you supposed to do? And the corporal said, hold on like hell. He had essentially learned the rhythm of the creeping barrage. What makes this even more extraordinary, and I don't think that, that Pierre or anybody else went into the effectiveness of this in their works uh, associated with Vimy, is that the upper levels of the Canadian army, from Curry on down through the brigadiers, down to the colonels, down to the captains, down to the sergeants, and right down to the corporals and the privates, all knew what the pattern was of the attack so that everything was shared with everybody. There was real fear in the Great War that there were spies everywhere and that the spies could steal the information of the plans that were coming and feed it back to the other side. Well, they managed to keep this secret and the rehearsals completely private so that as they did this, none of it leaked. And so they shared the information. Everybody knew the timing, the technique, uh, the strategy, the time of arrival, and essentially the date of victory. And it well, absolutely you, worked to clock. You, you've raised many great things and I'm just trying to catch up here. Um, I wanted to try to make the distinction between drilling and rehearsing because you know, as, as a writer, you can practice your keyboarding skills. 
uh, as a broadcaster, you can practice elocution, uh, but that isn't really rehearsing a script or proofreading uh, a book. They're, 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 this was a huge difference between normal military drilling and training. This was a rehearsal. And have I got that distinction correct? I think you do, because you've put your finger on a very important difference between Canadian soldiers and those of the other Allied armies. The majority of the Allied armies in Europe, the British and the French and so on, and the Germans to a certain extent, were regular troops. These were people who were lifetime soldiers. And so their lives were crisp, um, you know, neatly uh, pressed uniforms, snappy salutes, uh, order, um, obedience, essentially everything done to military excellence, to the clock, to the time, etc. The Canadians were volunteers. They were lumberjacks, fishermen, farmers, laborers, students. And essentially the difference between the Canadians and the regular armies in, in Europe was the Canadians were task oriented. And there's a big difference between obeying an army sergeant or a captain or a corporal and being able to figure out what it is you're to do because it's a task before you, not an order before you. And so there's a, there's a wonderful moment. Um, uh, you've noted in, in some of our discussions, some of the interesting uh, uh, people who were at Vimy. Harold Innes is one of them. Harold Innes is a very famous uh, man in, the, in his period in the, in the early days of the, the 20th century. Great. The inspiration for Marshall McLuhan. Yeah, he, he's a, a man of um, tremendous skill and understanding of economics, of, of history, of social interaction with, with, uh, with society and so on, and uh, an, an economist to, to boot. And when he goes to the, um, the fourth field battery, uh, he serves with his battery mates at uh, the Somme. And this man is an intellectual. He is brilliant. He's actually raced through the last stages of his career at school uh, in Canada to join the artillery and to serve overseas. And he considers the men among him in his battery, probably eight, 10, 12 guys, a bunch of luds. They just, they're just, they're nothing like him in terms of their sense of uh, the world, language, whatever, art, they, they have no concept. But suddenly the men who are the brawny ones and the men like Innes who are the brilliant ones come together and are essentially stitched into a task of making their gun do exactly what I just described in the minutes previous of delivering shells on target. And suddenly everything switched. And as Innes describes in his diary, suddenly we weren't fighting for king and country, we were fighting for Canada and each other. We got to know each other as men and how to deal with the task at hand. And that was the big difference between the army here and the army there. Now, this praise for rough and tumble Canadians is coming from author Ted Barris, and we're talking about Vimy Ridge and the victory that Canadians had there. Um, I wanted to emphasize this, this point once because other authors do it as well, that the Canadians were rough and tumble lumberjacks and farm boys and didn't mind digging a trench or uh, an underground railroad or uh, gun emplacements and you know hauling heavy uh, things around. Uh, whereas some of the other regular forces on both sides, German and British, um, were, what would we say, a little uh, less, uh, uh, less disposed to, to uh, manual labor and a little more refined or something. Uh, that is your take as well. Is that right? I think so. Um, remember, I did not interview anybody who was in the battle or who survived. it. I'm going entirely on what records I could find in diaries and letters home. Uh, and, and the diaries were illegal. I also found a few treasure troves of recorded interviews. Um, one of my wife's cousins uh, was a historian at the University of Victoria. And in the 1960s, he sent out some of his graduate students, this is like, you know, 50 years ago, um, to interview veterans of the Great War. And I found these tapes virtually sitting on a shelf at, at UVic, not touched in, you know, <laughs> 25, 30 years. And I, and they're all real to real tapes. Remember those? Mm -hmm. And actually <laughs> I, I dubbed them down, transcribed them. And in them, probably I found 20, 30 different accounts from Vimy all firsthand. Here's what I saw. Here's what I did. Here's what we accomplished. And that firsthand information 
as were the diaries, as were the letters, gave me a sense of the voice and the mentality and the brawn of these young men to do what they did. So I relied on the first person elements um, very uh, strictly in, in terms of my delivery of the story. You mentioned Pierre Burton, for whom I had the, have the greatest respect. He and I were not only fellow authors, we were also uh, fellow members of the Writers' Union of Canada and fought long and hard in the years that I knew Pierre to help build up the reputation of Canadian nonfiction writing and the authors who did it. And uh, we fought together against the larger community of fiction writers to make sure that those of us who wrote history were equally recognized and equally uh, involved in decision-making among authors. So we got to know each other that way. I also interviewed him probably a dozen or 15 times as a host. Uh, like you, Alan, I spent many years traveling around the country as a freelancer, uh, working in Toronto, working in Saskatoon, working in Edmonton. And in every one of those locations, I had my own radio shows. And whenever Pierre blew through with another book, I planted them down in front of me and we did another hour interview on the latest work. And I got to know him and the tremendous voice that he brought to his writing. The difference between his Vimy and mine is that his voice, quite rightly, is there as a raconteur telling the Canadians who are reading his book almost as if it's Uncle Pierre sitting you down on his knee and saying, and now I'm going to tell you the story of Vimy Ridge. I wanted to step back, let the first person accounts that I'd found be the driver, the narrative, the thread of the story, and, and almost let them, those voices, take you to the ground and let you see and hear what happened. Well, and, and you did that. And um, I'm, I enjoyed the book and I'm glad you did. Um, we, we've gone through so much material. I am forgetting that uh, the very famous World War I ace, Billy Bishop makes a, a brief appearance in your book. And he did have a couple of interesting dog fights with whom? Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron. But what makes, and, and, and he was not responsible for bringing the Red Baron down. Um, there's some conjecture and, and confusion and historical argument over that. But what makes Billy Bishop integral to the Vimy story is that he was involved in knocking down some of those German air surveillance balloons to clear the air, literally, of the, the German sight lines to the Allied side before the battle so that the Germans couldn't see what the Canadians were doing in developing this preparation for the battle. But even more interesting, he didn't know about what the creeping barrage was all about. And so uh, he had a number of interesting decisions to make on the day of the battle, because he was in the air. He knew that there would be a barrage and he was staying above the trajectory of those shells, but he had to decide whether he would take on board his um, new, Newport aircraft, which could only take a certain amount of weight, a radio receiver to hear instructions from the ground from headquarters or a radio transmitter to pass along to the ground on, on the, what he was seeing. And because if he had taken both, his plane wouldn't have been able to get off the ground. It would have been too heavy. He takes a transmitter so he can almost do a play-by-play -play of what he sees beneath him. He is in the air on the morning of the 9th and he looks down and through the barrage, he sees the Canadians, not running like mad, not chasing the Germans, but walking the Vimy glide steadily behind the shells. And he writes home to his aunt and his uncle, and I got a hold of those letters. He said, this was an extraordinary experience. He said, I looked down and there were the Canadians going up the ridge. And he said, he wrote, they look positively bored. <laughs> so he, he wasn't sure why they were doing it, but suddenly he realized that there was something significant about this technique. And he reported on it from a different venue or, or perspective. Now, I joked with you at the beginning that I was going to interview you about other people's books. Uh, so one other reference right there is The Power Broker by uh, Robert Caro, who wrote monumental volumes about LBJ. And the only comparison between you and him is that you actually go to these places and walk in these fields and go to the uh, research uh, areas and archives and what have you. The only thing I can offer, and it doesn't it come anywhere near the voluminous research you've done, is uh, my son took me on a tour of Oxford University uh, when he was a student there and pointed out the spire uh, uh, in the ornate uh, buildings there uh, that uh, uh, Baron von Richthofen climbed up, tied his handkerchief to, 
climbed back down perilously, went back to Germany to uh, join his country for uh, war because he was a student at Oxford, apparently. That was quite an interesting experience, as was uh, the deer quad where T.E. Lawrence had uh, hung a deer and cleaned it to uh, insult his fellow students. Uh, Ted, back to uh, Vimy. Thank you for enduring that. Uh, I, I want to learn a, a bigger lesson about management and life in general and what have you from Vinny, Vimy. The first thing we've already dealt with is the egalitarian, uh, or no, the tough, hardworking Canadians who, uh, whose hard work paid off. And, you know, that is kind of underrated these days with people talking about passion or about fit and, you know, all kinds of other things other than hard work. So that's point number one. Point number two is that so-called command and control, which was borrowed from the military more than 100 years ago by industry, uh, in effect often doesn't work because if you shout charge from way behind the lines and uh, soldiers are chest deep in mud, they can't very well follow your order. You gave the order and you can go back and have tea. So the egalitarian nature of, of the Vimy victory with uh, giving everyone maps, letting everyone know what the objective was, keeping everybody in the loop, I think that's a big lesson that, that even industry could learn today. I think so too, because it, we consider information as gold, as power. And I think what Arthur Curry and all of the men down the line beneath him recognized in their men was this character of task orientation and a sense of loyalty that didn't come from patriotism, uh, love of country, uh, service of the queen or the king and, and, and the empire, but having volunteered to accomplish what they were asked to do. In other words, it wasn't, we will drive the Germans to Berlin, it was, we will take that ridge. Let's figure out how to do it. And so there was a great trust factor, both in not allowing um, uh, uh, the other techniques that had been used, the sort of large you know, attacks at the Somme, for example, which were bloodied um, to, to, to rule the day, but to come up with these innovations, to allow McNaughton the freedom to try the flash spotting and the sound plotting, to allow the, the brigadiers to work with the corporals to walk across these tapes and, and get the sense of the rhythm of the battle. And essentially to uh, give free reign to your uh, subordinates to do their jobs. And that doesn't happen in military structure very often. It's not something that you, that you it's all by the book says here in the King's Regulations, ABC. They threw all that out. One of the other interesting moments that I discovered was um, the Canadians understood certain aspects of battle that the enemy would often be looking for those in command as targets. Um, in the Battle of the Somme, essentially you would have an officer clearly marked as such going out leading the men into the battlefield across the to battlefield to take on the enemy. What the Canadians decided to do was eliminate that advantage that might be there to be seeing who was an officer and who wasn't and dress everybody as corporals. <laughs> so the, the mass of men that the Germans eventually saw coming up the ridge were all corporals. There yeah. were no officers when in uh, fact there were officers in their midst. But the other element of this, and I'll just make one more point, is that in training everybody, they trained everybody more than once. Okay, you're a rifleman, but you're also gonna learn how to be a stretcher bearer. And if you're a stretcher bearer, you're gonna know what the sergeant knows. And if you're a sergeant, you're gonna know how to carry panniers, which carry the bullets, the, the magazines. And if you're a pannier carrier, you're also gonna be um, you know, somebody up the line. In other words, everybody knew everybody else's jobs. So that unlike in the Battle of the Somme, when the officer got killed and nobody knew where to go because he was the only one who had the strategy in his head and the, and the, the, the maps, everybody knew everything about it and they could fill in the gaps and keep going. That's a remarkable transition from you know, the 19th century battle to the 20th century battle. Uh, Ted, my urge uh, to interrupt that you can see non-verbally is uh, youthful exuberance. It's not rudeness. And secondly, I am smiling because I was going to then uh, ask you about a Shakespearean play. In Macbeth, as you know, Burnham Wood moves to Dunsinane, 
but in terms of concealing, the Canadians moved a church steeple. Please explain why. Well, if you can understand that the ground across France and Belgium, the battlefields and, and Luxembourg and, and all the low countries, the ground had been just churned and chopped to bits. There was absolutely nothing left of any of the towns in those areas close to the Western Front that you could recognize. Um, trees were gone, houses were gone. Uh, to a large extent, churches were gone, although not always. There was an attempt to preserve them and keep them uh, solitary and, and, and unmolested. When the Canadians recognized that the Germans who were shooting at them throughout this entire period with their barrages from the Douai Plain, the Germans, like the Canadians, were looking for targets. When they saw a church steeple, they recognized, ah, that's habitation. That's probably a place where behind the lines, Canadians are collecting on leave or to get fed or get served uh, if they have injuries or whatever. So rather than allow the Germans to have that sort of position point in the distance to focus on and fire at to kill Canadians or other allied troops, in literally one day and night, they moved the steeple to another location to fool the Germans into thinking that it was still the same, there were still people there, but in fact, it was far away from any habitation. Uh, Ted, there are so many other things. And, and by the way, I just want to verify, just for full disclosure, I did produce three pages of notes and questions. And if you hold up yours, you'll, anybody viewing will, will realize that I'm not just making that up. I have not referenced them once. Uh, interviewing you is like the old uh, joke from comedians who've told the joke so often, they just say number 17, number 22. So I feel like I could just say, would you please recount story number 39, and you would do it. But there are three areas in your tremendous book that we haven't touched on. One, very briefly, the famous people who make uh, cameo appearances. You've mentioned Harold Innes. There were many others, including uh, future Ontario Premier Leslie Frost. That's number one. Number two was the, the uh, ironic and tragic moments of death. You know, the couple of buddies and one says, oh, well, I'll go get a cigarette and stands up and he's, he's dead. Uh, and then the other is the uh, horrific and unsanitary conditions of those fields, whereby if someone had even a minor injury, they, they were in, in danger of dying through infection. So t touch on those three things, if you don't mind, because I think they're, they're really important. And I think that the way you bring both ordinary and uh, people who are going to be famous later in life in, into, into Vimy Ridge, I think is, is brilliant. So uh, you take it away with stories 39, 40, and 41, please, Ted. Well, um, I had, have to say, Alan, that I, I didn't expect to find these little nuggets. And indeed, they're, they're not huge. Um, the fact that Harold Ennis is in the book is because I was allowed to see his diaries. And that revealed that incredible transition from a guy who thought his pals were louts to an understanding of the task at hand. Um, Connie Smythe, who was famous for his connection to uh, hockey in Canada, was an artilleryman, um, later associated mostly with the 48th Highlanders, which is why when the Maple Leafs open every season, every time the season opener is on uh, Maple Leafs ice, so are the 48th Highlanders. So that was that connection. Um, you mentioned, reminded me, and I'd forgotten, Frederick Banting was at Vimy. And not surprisingly, he's there as a surgeon. Now, he's not recognized in 1917 for the work that he would do later in the discovery of penicillin and all of that, uh, but he was there as a field surgeon. Now, I've done a great deal of work and study in, a, in another more recent book called Rush to Danger, which one day we'll talk about, uh, about the role of, of uh, medics, field surgeons, stretcher bearers, ambulance drivers, and so on. Banting was there, and there's the book. Visual aids. <laughs> Um, so, so he sort of, it's, as you rightly put it, it's a cameo. He's there and then he's gone. Um, Leslie Frost, who was the uh, long time, uh, many years premier of Ontario, was there with his brother Cecil and a dear friend of mine named Ray Fleming. Uh, Ray's a historian and a, and a professor uh, at Trent University. He had found the letters that, that Leslie and that Cecil had sent home to their parents from the front. And so there with the Simcoe 
uh, Regiment or Simcoe Battalion, they are there as well in the vicinity of Vimy. So some of those people are famous um, and it kind of makes the, the book uh, a nice stepping stone periodically to find those people. But you're right, the, 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 the soul of this book, the soul of the victory is average everyday volunteers who are slogging through those trenches. And by slogging through trenches, I mean mud. France and Belgium are mud and they are farm fields, which means that they're fertilized by manure, which means as you pointed out, the minute you have even a cut, a nick or a serious wound, it's infected. And no matter what Frederick Banting could do as a field surgeon to sew you back together or to assist you in some fashion, repair a broken leg. But if you had a wound that opened your body to exposure, all the surgeons in the world couldn't save you because infection would kill you because we had no antibiotics to fight that infection from the manure. So it was just the worst of conditions. And then if the manure and the mud didn't get you, the rats did, they were everywhere. Um, what's interesting, and I guess it comes back to that sense of, of uh, a task at hand to me when I think about the stories of the men in the trenches is they were almost often uh, walking over the skeletons of the bodies of the French and the British who had been there in previous iterations of the war. Um, and in fact, there was a, a macabre practice uh, in one location where I think there was a partial hand and arm sticking out of the mud and there obviously in its bone structure and, and, and in one piece. And it was a lucky charm to touch it on the way through going over the top. I mean, this is totally macabre, but something that only the people who had endured these experiences in those trenches could understand and survive. Now, when you mention, uh, uh, as we both did, Leslie Frost and Harold Innes, uh, Innes College is named after him, uh, Con Smythe associated with uh, sports and recreation and, and many, many other people. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what Canadian public policy and life and recreation and day-to-day -day living um, how that was affected in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even the 80s. I mean, Lester Pearson and John Diefenbaker were World War I veterans. Do you, do you have any speculation on how that, their participation in something like Vimy affected all of us who weren't even born at the time because they were affecting public policy? Well, I'm gonna sort of pivot the, the answer a little bit, Alan, because I don't know that I can address that. Yes, you're right. Some of those people did have first with Lester Pearson and John Diefenbaker and so on, had these connections to the war. But my one of my theses in the book is that, and I've taken a lot of flack for this because it's a sort of a traditional mantra. And that is that Vimy was the birth of a nation we discovered our nationhood there. A lot of historians criticize me and others who have that thought, and mine isn't an original thought, think it's a lot of hooey. Well, that's because they've read too many of the officers' accounts, too many of the generals' accounts. When you get down in the muck where I am with the average soldier, you find a man named Gregory Clark. Gregory Clark, after the war, became a very famous journalist. He was a reporter at the Toronto Star, I believe, uh, the Daily Star, it was, as it was known, during the First War. And there's a wonderful story in the book where he hears about this incredible rush of volunteers in Toronto. And he goes, he's on, he's a, he's a sort of a cub reporter at the Toronto Star at the moment. And he goes to his editor and he says, I want to go and cover this and see what's going on, why all these guys are joining up. And the editor considers this guy is, this guy, Greg, is, is Clark is, is young, he's virile, he, he might get scooped up as a volunteer. But he says, eh, maybe you're scrawny enough, it won't matter, they won't try to, to recruit you. Well, that's exactly what happens. <laughs> he goes to the, to the enlistment center and a very savvy recruitment officer looks Clark up and down and says, you know, Clark, you'd make great officer material. Boom, he's gone. He joins the, I think it was the 4th Mounted Rifles, serves at Vimy. But what it does for me as a historian is to have a journalist on the ground with the skills of reporting in his head and his hands and an ability to capture the moment. And unlike all those people who criticize my theory about this being the birth of a nation, there it is in black and white, Gregory Clark 
talks about going up the ridge with the fourth mounted. And he said, to the right of me were the men from Nova Scotia. To the left of me were the men from the prairies. It was Canada going up the ridge, his exact words. And then that evening or an evening later, after they made the ridge and seized it from the Germans, he writes down, this is a, a title of one of my chapter headings in the book. It was my first full sense of nationhood. Well, if that's not proof that it was a birth of a nation when men who had been previously told you're fighting for king and empire to believe that it was a Canadian emperor enterprise is very much proof that something was happening there more than just a victory. So one old journalist to the other, I can't resist the self-deprecating humor. Uh, your position basically is uh, war is uh, not bad enough. You got to have a couple of journalists along with you just to make things worse. Is that right? <laughs> well, to keep us on the straight and narrow, I think, because his accounts are brilliant. Yeah. And I found others like that, uh, memoirists who wrote memoirs illegally, um, surgeons, uh, uh, medics who, um, um, there was a medic in Montreal, I can't remember his name now, but he wrote letters to his mother from the front. And, and describes everything from dog fights he saw overhead to the way he treated men in, in, the, uh, in the field ambulance to the strategy of the battle around him. It was a tremendous uh, sense of observation just from a, a man who, not highly educated, but understood that history was happening around him and he better record it. And there's one other odd character, a bit of a cliche, but a, a real person, I gather, uh, who makes an appearance in your book and others, and that is the British officer who walks into battle with a walking stick and a revolver, uh, bolt upright. Um, there is another account in another book about an, uh, an officer riding by on a horse, not wanting to ask enlisted men directions, because that would be kind of déclassé. Uh, and, uh, and debasing of his uh, rank, and he rides off probably to his death uh, so that he doesn't have to engage with the enlisted men. And that puts the Canadian egalitarianism kind of in context, doesn't it? It does. I, it, you're going to have to forgive me be, because I've forgotten his name, um, and so it, it slips my memory. But uh, uh, to me, the, those moments of, of um, oddity are also part of the time. Um, the fact that, that men were characters, even in the midst of this extraordinary story, that you would have this guy in a walking stick, that you would have a man who, like Ennis, was a brilliant economist sitting there uh, with his hands on a piece of artillery, that a guy from Musiman, Saskatchewan, um, Andrew McNaughton, was using the science of artillery to win the battle and save lives. Uh, all of this is so bizarre when you realize its roots are from the traditions across Canada, the lives these men led, um, and not to, to uh, forget the women. Uh, there's some great stories of nurses. One of my favorite stories in all of my research is the story of, of um, Grace McPherson. And uh, she is a, an ambulance driver, uh, 60 kilometers behind the lines on the coast of France, where there were eight, 10, 12 different hospitals. And she's driving in her ambulance, the men coming out of Vimy on the trains from behind Vimy back to the coast to go to those hospitals. And in her ambulance, she's loading them in by hand and taking them to the hospitals to deliver them to uh, the surgeons and the, and the, uh, uh, the nurses who will attend them. Um, she didn't get that job by accident. She fought for it. Here was a woman who grew up in Vancouver at the turn of the century, first woman in Vancouver to have a driver's license, first woman in Vancouver to have a car that she owned. And when suddenly she discovers that she has this capability to drive and to do so in the service of others, why not become an ambulance driver? Well, the Canadian government, the Canadian Red Cross, the British government, the British Red Cross turn her down. She decides, I'm going anyway. She saves up her money, gets on a ship, gets to England, starts to work at the Canadian barracks in London, and is constantly looking for the chance to make her pitch to become an ambulance driver. Well, she suddenly discovers, all at some point in 1916, Sam Hughes, Sam Hughes was Canada's Minister of Munitions and War. And she discovers he's suddenly staying at uh, a hotel in London and she seeks an interview. Well, why not? He considers, I'll give her a few minutes. In she comes and she says she goes to the top of the Savoy Hotel. And I think he's in the presidential suite or whatever the hell it is. And there are other generals sitting around him because they're having a meeting. 
So he allows this woman to come in and Grace goes in feeling really nervous and scared, but says to Sir Sam, I have come to serve my country. I have a capability to drive. Would you allow me to become an ambulance driver? And of course, he's sitting there with all these, what she refers to as cross swords. These are generals with their cross swords on their collars. She said there was a bunch of cross swords there. And she says to Sir Sam, I have come on my own ability, my own ticket to get here to serve. Will you not assist me? And he says, under no circumstances will I allow a woman to be at the front. She leaves somewhat disappointed and distressed. But she says as she's leaving, with your help, Sir Sam, or without it, I will serve. Well, not long after that, the world turns upside down for Sam Hughes, partly because it's discovered, allegedly, he's taking kickbacks on the sale of Ross rifles to the Canadian Army. And Ross rifles turn out to be the worst rifles for anybody but snipers. They're, they're great when they're dry and when they're not muddy. Well, what was there a lot of in France and Belgium but muck and wetness? Anyway, so they decide to uh, change rifles and they oust Sir Sam. They go to the Lee Enfield. And all the jobs that had been principally male jobs, even behind the front, such as ambulance driving, become open because the men, they decide after Sam Hughes are best serving the war effort at the front, the driver's seats of the ambulances become open and Grace gets her wish. And she serves for a year from the middle of 1917, right to the end of the war at uh, Boulogne and a top driving the, the wounded from behind Vinnie. Literally, she, her first day on the job is April the 9th, 1917. So and her experience. What did she say to uh, wounded soldiers complaining from the back of the ambulance? Stop making such noise. I'm not going to take that in my ambulance. <laughs> so she, was a, she was quite a, quite a, a force. And, and what I think what struck me, and it goes back to my point about Gregory Clark and how this was a an evolution of Canada among Canadians. Grace from Vancouver said in, in her, and I saw her diaries, she said, I was proud to serve my country. I was proud to assist in the saving of lives and to be connected to the army to do that. But she said, I was most proud of the Canada patch on my shoulder. Well, let's give an honorable mention to uh, Tom Clark. I believe Gregory Clark's grandson, who was a longtime CTV reporter and anchor then over at Global and he had me on his uh, show the West Wing uh, or the West Block. I'm in the wrong country there. Uh, so I bet he's very proud of his grandfather as well. Indeed. Um, and, and Ted, as an old broadcaster, you'll remember that the Pierre Burton show, the TV talk show was about a half an hour. I think we've exceeded that. But uh, David Frost did 90 minutes and we've not quite reached that. So we're in still in the sweet spot. The book is Vimy. Thank you for your effort. It's wonderful. And come back soon. We've got a lot of other books to talk about. My pleasure, Alan. Thanks for having me along. Cheers.